going to do our tutorial now regarding the lecture we've just completed uh, tutorial number nine for CEA 204 uh, talking about um, struts and columns question A um, we have a, uh, a load of uh, we're looking for the, the actual load that this will take this particular section um, we've got a moment of inertia of 1.14 times 10 to the 6 Young's modulus or modulus of elasticity of two, for steel of 200 by 10 cubed the length is the effective length and I've made a little sketch on the side there to show you that the length equals the length equals 1 from that table that shows you the end fixity conditions for uh, struts so we um, find that we can on, under those circumstances we can actually carry a load on that particular strut of 250.1 kilonewtons and if we have a factor of safety of 2 we have to reduce it divided by 2 so the safe load you can stick on there is 125.05 kilonewtons um, looking at part B where we're using uh, the Rankin uh, Perry Robertson formula it's uh, pretty straightforward similar to what the problem I did in the lecture FC is the stress in the steel A is the area of the section uh, 1 plus the factor little a for the actual fixity conditions which is uh, pinned at both ends 1 over 7500 multiplied by the length of the strut divided by the uh, radius of gyration ry all squared gives us a load total load of 189 kilonewtons now with a factor of safety of 2 we come out with a load, safe load that the strut can carry of 94.5 kilonewtons according to Rankin Perry Robertson and um, a, uh, a load according to Euler of 125 and yeah, it's, yeah we illustrate quite uh, uh, quite lucidly the difference in a purely mathematical solution and allowing for some initial bending in the actual strut that's how we have that's why we have a, a load that's only about three quarters of what we find by the pure mathematical solution uh, question two is a timber post four meters long 100 by 100 in cross section fully fixed at both ends what load can the post carry if the allowable stress in the timber is six newtons per square millimeter there's a bit of a catch in this one which we'll see when we do the uh, solution the uh, elastic modulus for the timber we've taken is 12 kilonewtons per square millimeter the I for the square section is BD cubed over 12 BD cubed over 12 because it's a square section I mean you could write 100 to the fourth over 12 but BD cubed over 12 Gives us a moment of inertia of 8.333 times 10 to 6 millimeters to the fourth. Plugging that into the formula, into the standard Euler formula, and bearing in mind that our effective length from the table, I think it was 4632 was the table, gives us an effective length of 0.7, you know, it's somewhere there like that. That's the effective length that you're taking, or the rate, the factor that you're taking to shorten in inverted commas the length of the column is 0.7 multiplied by the actual length of the column which is 4 meters all squared plugging that into the formula we get a figure of 126 kilonewtons theoretically that's what that 100 by 100 timber post can carry with an elastic modulus of 12 times 10 to the power of 3 but the stress from this load on the timber is 12.6 newtons per square millimeter and if you read question two carefully you'll say what it asks you what load can the post carry if the allowable stress in the timber is six newtons per square millimeter 
I've written, but the stress is limited to six newtons per square millimeter. So it's a simple case of taking the stress multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the strut. The allowable load then, therefore is 60 kilonewtons, not 126 kilonewtons. So that's the catch. Where you, where you, where a allowable stress is uh, given to you, you have to take a cognizance of that and check that the stress from your Euler calculation does not exceed that. That's what I've done over here. Um, if you can see it there, sorry, I'll just go over that again. Stress is limited to 6 newtons per square millimetre, 6 times 100 squared, allowable load 60 kilonewtons, not being overstressed. That's question 2, so getting on to question 3. Um, question 3 says, if a mild steel post with an outside diameter of 100 millimeters and an inside diameter of 90 millimeters was substituted for the timber post in question two, the one we've just done, what load could it carry? Something that I want to just warn you about is that you often asked to do calculations like this and you have to work out the wall thickness. The wall thickness is not 10 millimeters. The wall thickness is five millimeters. Why? Because if you've got 90 millimeters inside diameter, plus 5 is 95, plus 5 is 100. I've seen students often make that mistake, so be aware that you don't simplify it like that when you get to those sorts of problems. Anyway, moving on, we work out the moment, the, uh, mo the axis, uh, moment of inertia about an axis of this tube, and it could be any one of these axes because it's a circle. The formula is pi d to the fourth minus little d to the fourth over 64. And of course, big d to the fourth is the outside diameter. Little d is the inside diameter. It gives you an inertia of 1,688,334 millimeters to the power of four. Putting it into Euler's formula, pi squared multiplied by the modulus of elasticity for the steel, 200 times 10 cubed multiplied by the inertia that you've computed over there, divided by the effective length of the strut as computed in question two, because it's the same configuration of strut, four meters long, fixed at both ends. 0.7 is the effective length times 4,000 all squared. Gives you a load of 425.1 kilonewtons. Now, what you've been asked to use is a factor of safety of two, so you can divide that load by two, which will give you a safe load of 212.5 kilonewtons. That's that problem done. Moving on to question number four. Select a universal column, assuming one end fixed and the other pinned, 3.5 meters long to carry an axial load of 1,600 kilonewtons. So the effective length looking at your tables is 0.85, where you have one end fixed, fixed in and the other end pinned. The effective length is 0.85, not 0.7, not 1. 1 is for pinned ends, 0.7 is uh, for fixed ends. This one is part fixed and, and on one end and pinned on the other end. Now we've got to use a factor of safety of three in this particular problem. So the easiest way to do it is just to um, elevate the load by multiplying it by three, which gives you a total load you use in your calculation of 4,800 kilonewtons. Putting that into Euler's formula, 4,800 kilonewtons, bring it to newtons. And we've transposed the formula, of course. We've made I the subject. Um, or, or we're solving this problem uh, in relation to I. Um, we've got 4,800 times 10 cubed for P. The KL squared now appears in the top of the equation. 0.85 times 3.5 meters squared. And the pi squared EI has gone to the bottom pi squared times uh, e, because we're looking for the moment of inertia. So 
moment of inertia we requires 20.491 times 10 to the 6 millimeters the fourth. You can, from your um, uh, one steel tables, one steel are a manufacturer of hot rail steel sections. I've spoken to you about that before and I presume you've all downloaded those tables or that you've got easy access on your computers to the tables. You, you, you choose a universal column from the one steel tables. Um, a universal column of 250 UC 72.9 kilograms per lineal meter with a least moment of inertia of 38.8 .8 times 10 to the 6. And that's the closest we can get actually because it is a very small selection of, uh, of universal columns. So we've had to escalate that quite a lot to go to 38.8. There's nothing in between. And so we, we faced with that. But remember always that you use the least moment of inertia because the, the column will buckle about the least moment of inertia. As I've, I've said that over here, NB, we select the universal column based on its lowest I, i.e. IYY, which is always smaller than IXX. Question five, the top chord of a Warren Gerda and a Warren Gerda, just to, to remind you, is a Gerda that looks like this. You've solved these uh, in using the method of joints for solving trusses. This is a Warren Gerda, part of it, cut it off there, there's the support. All the top cord will be in compression. Whatever the, the down loading is, all these members will be in compression. So what the question is saying is the top cord and doesn't specify which one. Has an axial compressive force, let's just say it's this one there, an axial compressive force of 360 kilonewtons imposed on it due to the loading arrangement on the Warren girder. The spacing between the node points is two meters, and these are the node points. So the Warren Gerda is fixed at those points. And it is assumed that the member is fully fixed at these points. That's why we've used this. This is the Warren Gerda. Oh, sorry, this is the top cord, though I've drawn it standing vertically, it's actually horizontal. But that's the end fixity, which gives us a factor of 0.7. The total load is 360 kilonewtons in it and we asked to use a factor of safety of 2. We just escalate the load by a factor of 2 to give us a load, a design load of 720 kilonewtons. Putting that into um, the, uh, Euler's formula, taking account of the uh, factor for uh, end fixity and uh, what, what we're setting out to do is to find what IYY is. We know what P is because we've just worked that out over there. The IYY we require to satisfy this equation is 680,000 um, uh, millimeters to the fourth, or 0.69 times 10 to the six millimeters to the fourth, because this is how it's generally set out in steel tables. It's usually to, to the power, uh, power of six, 10 to the power of six. If you look at your tables, you can, you'll choose a 100 by 100 by 10 equal angle, which has an IYY of 0.696, which is very fortuitous as it's very close to the required moment of inertia. It has an area, which you can look up on the table, of 1810 square millimeters. Now, this is the YY axis there, and if you put this angle into compression, it would buckle around that it's almost intuitive, you'd know that it would flatten itself out. These two legs would go like that and it would just become flat as you squashed it. And that's why we take that axis, not the x-axis, which runs that way for an angle. Okay. Moving on to the last question. If the member in five above was in tension, if this member was in tension there, um, possibly... Uh, what? Possibly this member here would be in tension, there, with the loading we've got. That would be in tension because this one would be in compression, 
as you all know, I'm sure. So this one would be in tension. But if the member that we were designing was the same length and it was in tension, the load was 360 kilonewtons, again with a factor of safety of 2. The load we'd have to design for was 720 kilonewtons, and it's, it's simply a case of stress equals load over area, which you've been doing ever since you started doing engineering fundamentals. So the area then is the load divided by the stress. You need an area of 2,400 square millimeters. And if you look through your tables, you'll find that 125 by 125 by 12 equal angle with an area of 2,870 square millimeters satisfies the equation. So that, uh, that winds that up. That's uh, tutorial number nine for uh, struct one. Thank you.